Hello, I'm Professor John Blakeman from the UW Students Point Political Science Department, and I'd like to welcome you back to my ongoing lecture series on rugby. And so today's lecture, which will be about three hours long, is we're going to focus on the laws of the game, and we're going to work our way through the about 150 pages of the rugby law book. So oh, wait, you're not here to talk about rugby, are you? Ah, okay. Hold on just one second. Ah, there we go. That's right. This is my ongoing lecture series on the U.S. Constitution. This is lecture number six on the famous Supreme Court case Marbury versus Madison. And remember, this lecture series is sponsored by the UWSP Alumni Association and their Alumni College Experience. Now, briefly, Marbury versus Madison is one of the most important Supreme Court cases in our nation's history, one of the most important constitutional law cases in our nation's history. And as we'll see in the following lecture, uh, where I explain some of the history and politics underlying the case, Marbury versus Madison really sets the stage for our ongoing debates over how we interpret the Constitution. Okay, well, let's get started. I refer to this case as John Marshall versus Thomas Jefferson. Believe it or not, they are distant relatives. They're both from Virginia. They are both great Virginians. They are very prominent in how the new constitution is developing in terms of the power that the federal government has. Uh, you might recall that, that Thomas Jefferson is the Secretary of State in George Washington's administration. John Marshall is a member of the House of Representatives from the state of Virginia. He's developing his own political career. John Marshall is a famous Revolutionary War veteran as well. Thomas Jefferson uh, is not a veteran. He was in Paris during much of the revolution. So they're just some relatives. They have a different background. They're from the same state. They're proud Virginians. They absolutely hate each other, evidently. We can also think about this case in terms of Federalists versus Anti-Federalists. And remember, the Federalists are those people, Alexander Hamilton, for example, uh, who want to build a strong, powerful national government. As Hamilton writes in one of his Federalist papers in 1788 and 1789, you know, he writes about how the United States, the young United States has to emerge as a very economically powerful nation. And as Alexander Hamilton sees it, it will emerge as such with a strong national government. So the Federalists are interested in interpreting the Constitution in a way that empowers the national government. The Anti-Federalists, sometimes called the Democratic Republicans or the Jeffersonian Republicans, are sort of the opposite. You know, they, they've come on board to the Constitution by the 1790s, but they want to restrict national power or federal power. It's, sometimes we might call them states' rights advocates, sometimes not. It's hard to pinpoint them, but they certainly think that the states have more power than the national government. This debate comes back. You know, it, it, it's embedded in Marbury versus Madison, to be sure, but we will come back to it in another case soon, McCullough versus Maryland. Now, one place to start with them with Marbury versus Madison, and that's with the Constitution. And so Article 3 of the Constitution sets up the federal judiciary. Section 1 tells us that we have to have one Supreme Court and inferior courts as Congress establishes. And that pretty much means Congress gets to create the federal judiciary, which it does. In Section 2, I've highlighted for you at the bottom, you know, Section 2, Article 3, Section 2, talks about federal jurisdiction, federal judicial power over certain types of cases. And it says explicitly, in cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, meaning foreign diplomats, and those in which a state shall be a party, or one state sues another state perhaps, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all other cases, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction. Now, what that means, original jurisdiction, that's where the Supreme Court acts as a trial court. 
it hears evidence from two sides, you know, two adversaries, a plaintiff and defendant, for example. And the Supreme Court decides on the veracity of the evidence presented to us and decides the case. And so in cases concerning ambassadors, of which there are very, very, very few in our nation's history, if an ambassador, foreign ambassador, sues an American citizen or is sued by an American citizen, the ambassador can bring that case directly to the U.S. Supreme Court and the court acts as a trial court. But remember the Constitution says there are only a limited there are only limited types of cases where the court acts in original jurisdiction. Ambassadors, diplomats, and when states are a party. In all other cases, the court has appellate jurisdiction. And what that means in a nutshell is the Supreme Court is an appeals court. It reviews what lower trial courts have decided. It does not act as a trial court in and of itself. It reviews what lower trial courts have decided. So the Supreme Court, in a sense, is dependent upon the lower trial court and how the lower trial court and even a jury view evidence, and in a criminal case, guilt or innocence, or in a civil case, liability. This is an important distinction. Now, Section 25 of the 1789 Judiciary Act, really boring, one of the very first statutes passed by Congress. So remember, the, Cong the Constitution says Congress creates the federal judiciary. This is what the 1789 Judiciary Act does. Congress creates the federal judiciary. And Section 13 of that statute, really important because this is where we get to Marbury versus Madison, says that the Supreme Court shall have the power to issue writs, the writ of mandamus especially, which is at issue in the Marbury case, in cases warranted by the principles and usage of law to any courts appointed under the authority of the United States. Now, what's going on in Section 13 of the Judiciary Act, it looks like Congress is changing the Supreme Court's jurisdiction. I know this sounds really legalistic, and it is, but as we'll see in Marbury versus Madison, the question comes up, can, can Congress do that? So the political context to all of this stuff. So we have the election of 1800, one of the ugliest, nastiest elections in American political history, seriously. And Adams and Jefferson, Adam, John Adams is the current holder of the White House. Jefferson has challenged him. The Electoral College is tied. And so the election goes into the House of Representatives per the Constitution, where the House, after over 30 votes, finally elects Thomas Jefferson the winner. Adams is livid. So livid, in fact, that he leaves Washington before uh, Thomas Jefferson's inauguration. He does not stick around to attend the inauguration, which some might say is sort of rude. Anyway, Adams is a Federalist. Jefferson is an anti-Federalist, a Jeffersonian Republican. There's, the Federalists have essentially been swept out of office. Not only have they lost the White House in 1800, but they've lost control of Congress as well. So one thing the Federalists do, <clears throat> excuse me, and remember, you know, between our elections and the time new office holders are sworn in, there's often a couple of months. And so what the Federalists do before they leave office is they pass a new law in January 1801. We, we call it the Midnight Judges Act, which creates about 50 new federal judges all of whom will be appointed by President Adams before he leaves the White House. And it's pretty, you know, pretty much guaranteed that all of them will be Federalists. So yeah, the Federalists are packing the bench, as we call it. You know, we complain about that now. Oh, the Democrats, the Republicans, they're putting their own people onto the federal judiciary. Well, guess what? It's a practice that goes back to 1801. 
Now, that's exactly what happens. All 50 plus new federal judges are Federalists. They are appointed by Adams. They are quickly confirmed by the Senate before the Senate flips to the, to the anti-Federalists. And it leads to this interesting situation because back then, the Secretary of State had to physically deliver the piece of paper, the commission that allowed a federal judge to be a judge, literally a piece of paper. John Marshall is John Adams's, President Adams's Secretary of State. And of course, one of the last things Adams does is he appoints John Marshall to be the new Chief Justice of the United States. So this is really funny when you think about it. So it's John Marshall's job as Secretary of State to deliver these commissions. There's a story about how he hires his cousin to do it, and his cousin delivers most of them, but not all of them. And we end up with this guy, William Marbury, who's appointed as a federal judge, confirmed by the Senate, yet he doesn't get the piece of paper that allows him to serve as a judge. John Marshall leaves the Secretary of State's office and becomes Chief Justice of the United States. Thomas Jefferson comes into the White House. J James Madison, the great James Madison is Jefferson's Secretary of State. And there's a story, I don't know if it's true or not, about how Madison walks into the Secretary of State's office, sees this stack of papers on the desk, vacated by John Marshall, realizes they are judicial commissions that have not been delivered, and asks President Jefferson, the new President Jefferson, what to do about this. And Jefferson is adamant that they are not to be delivered. Well, there's a lot of intrigue here, it seems like. And, you know, maybe some of this isn't entirely accurate. It is certainly the case, though, that John Marshall of Secretary of State never got around to delivering the commission to William Marbury. And so William Marbury sues the new Secretary of State, James Madison, to get the commission. And Madison and Jefferson are adamant about not giving it up. Hence, Marbury versus Madison. Okay, now bear with me because I am going to um, get to the case. So here we go. Now, hopefully you all can see that. Uh, sort of fine print for me, but I'll do the best that I can. Now, uh, right at the very beginning of the opinion, uh, let's see, let me uh, get my annotator up here so I can follow along. So right here, the Supreme Court says, Chief Justice John Marshall, I should say, who's writing the opinion, he says, um, there are basically three questions in this case. Has the applicant a right to the commission? That is, does William Marbury have a right, a legal right to be a judge? Second, if he has a right and the right has been violated, does the law afford him a remedy? And then third, this is the important question, is the remedy they, a, a writ of mandamus, as it's called, coming from the Supreme Court? Now to explain that just briefly. So William Marbury has sued James Madison and instead of William Marbury, going to a federal trial court in Washington, D.C., he jumps directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. He has read the 1789 Judiciary Act, which has given the Supreme Court the power to grant a writ of mandamus against a government official. And that suggests, as Marbury sees it, that suggests that the U.S. Supreme Court can serve as a trial court and grant the mandamus against James Madison. Marbury gets his commission. He only has to go to one court and he's done. Now, this is really tricky. So let me move on ahead here. Now, over here, you know, the Supreme Court says it is the case that um, Marbury got his commission lawfully. Now, and, and what's going on? You know, the Supreme Court is saying, 
essentially, that the process in the Constitution was followed. That John Adams, as president, appointed William Marbury a judge, and that's what the Constitution requires. So the Constitution was followed. Okay, now let me expand that a little more. There we go. That's a little better. So Marbury is, in a sense, lawfully a judge. Now, moving on, I don't want to spend too much time on that. John Marshall, he, he sort of addresses the third question, the remedy. If, if it's the case that, that William Marbury is lawfully a judge, what's the remedy here? Is he entitled to the remedy that he asks for? And what Marshall is getting at is, is essentially, can the U.S. Supreme Court grant that mandamus, writ the mandamus against James Madison? That's what Marshall's trying to get at. And so Marshall has narrowed the question down dramatically. The Supreme Court recognizes that Marbury has a right to be a judge, but the question remains about how that right should actually be enforced. I guess think about it like that. But Marshall, you know, he gets into the, the question about the Judiciary Act of 1789. And he gets... He narrows the question down even more to, can Congress actually change the Supreme Court's jurisdiction like that? So, over here, he says, can this writ of mandamus issue from the Supreme Court, the act to establish the judicial courts of the United States, authorizes the Supreme Court to issue writs of mandamus in cases warranted? So he's talking about the judiciary. The Secretary of State being a person holding an office under the authority of the United States, it is precisely within the letter of the description. And if this court is not authorized to issue a writ of mandamus to such an officer, it must be because the law is unconstitutional. So what Marshall is saying is that the Secretary of State is a government official, the writ of mandamus is it's an old common law writ that a court can order against a government official. And Marshall is sort of saying, yeah, this is yeah, the right way to proceed, but there is this constitutional question out there. Does the Supreme Court actually have the power to do this? Now, over here, it has been insisted that in the original grant of jurisdiction to the Supreme Court, it's general. And the clause assigning original jurisdiction, and here Marshall means uh, the Article Three clause that spells out federal jurisdiction. The clause assigning original jurisdiction to the Supreme Court contains no negative or restrictive words. The power remains in the legislature to assign original jurisdiction to that court in other cases. So Marshall's pointing out an argument made to the Supreme Court, which is, well, Article 3 grants original jurisdiction in certain cases to the Supreme Court. Article 3 does not place limits on that. So Congress must have the authority to change the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction. Now, this is really, really important because this is where we start talking about constitutional interpretation and how we interpret the Constitution, obviously. And Marshall goes on to say, if it had been intended to leave it to the discretion of the legislature to apportion the judicial power between the supreme and inferior courts, according to the legislature, the will of the body, it would certainly have been useless, useless in the Constitution uh, to proceed further. Now, interestingly, and this is, this is the, the section I always like to, to bring up with my students, Marshall says, affirmative words are often in their operation negative of other objects than those affirmed. 
And you got to really wrap your mind about around that one. What the heck is he trying to say? Affirmative words are often in their operation negative of other objects than those affirmed. And in this case, a negative or exclusive sense must be given to them or they have no meaning at all. What's he saying? Well, what he means is this. In Article 3 of the Constitution, the words granting the Supreme Court original jurisdiction, the affirmative words, they also negate other things. So the affirmative words granting the Supreme Court original jurisdiction in Article 3 of the Constitution negate Congress from changing that. It cannot be presumed, Marshall writes, that any clause in the Constitution is intended to be without effect. And therein, such a construction is inadmissible unless the words require it. Now, Marshall is being a textualist here. He's telling us what words mean, but he's also saying affirmative words, words that grant a power, often in their operation, prohibit other powers. But I always like to point out to my students, he says often. It's like he's pulling a punch there. Often, not always, not seldom, but often. Well, hard to figure out what he means. But he's taking a stab at constitutional interpretation, and he's telling us that we should read the text so that when it grants a power, in operation, it will typically negate another power. Now, over here, Marshall talks about the writ of mandamus. I don't think we need to get into so much detail about that. It is important. Um, but what Marshall is ultimately getting at to work our way through the opinion here is that congress in the judiciary act of 1789 when it granted original juris when it changed i should say the original jurisdiction of the u.s supreme court it expanded it it couldn't do that because the constitution was clear the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction is limited to certain things only. Now, Marshall goes on to say, you know, uh, the powers of the legislature are defined and limited, and that those limits may not be mistaken or forgotten, the Constitution is written. We know that. The Constitution limits congressional power. If those limits do not confine the persons on whom they are imposed, and if acts prohibited and acts allowed are of equal obligation, it is a proposition too plain to be contested that the Constitution controls any legislative act repugnant to it, or that the legislature may alter the Constitution by an ordinary act. He basically gives us a dichotomy. He says, Oh, you got two choices. You either read the Constitution so that it controls any legislative act repugnant to it, or you allow the legislature to alter the Constitution by an ordinary law. And Marshall goes on to say, you know, in a written Constitution, it's implied that it's a fundamental law. There's no question about that. He says this, this is the theory of a written Constitution, that it is fundamental law, and you can't change it with a simple statute. Now, this part right here is really interesting. It is emphatically, as Marshall writes, the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. If two laws conflict, the courts must decide on the operation of each. So it's the province and duty of the judiciary to decide when there's a conflict of laws, which law controls. So if a law be in opposition to the Constitution, 
if both the law and the Constitution apply to a particular case, so that the court must either decide that case conformably to the law, disregarding the Constitution, or conformably to the Constitution, disregarding the law, the court must determine which. And for Marshall, you know, there's no question here. Ultimately, judges interpret the Constitution since it's a fundamental law. And when the Constitution and a regular law conflict, the province and duty of judges is to apply the Constitution. And he says, could it be the intention of those who gave power to judges to say that in using it, the Constitution should not be looked into, should not be interpreted? That is the case arising, that a case arising under the Constitution should not be decided without examining the Constitution under which it arises. This is too extravagant to be maintained, he says. For him, it doesn't make sense. So, in declaring what this shall be the supreme law of the land to end the case, the Constitution itself is first mentioned and not the laws of the United States generally, but those only which shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution. There he's talking about Article 6 of the Supremacy Clause, where the Constitution says, the Constitution and all laws made under it shall be the supreme law of the land. The Constitution's mentioned first in the Supremacy Clause. So as Marshall sees it, the placement of the words themselves govern what happens next. The Constitution's mentioned first in the Supremacy Clause, and it governs everything that follows what he calls the particular phraseology of the Constitution. Now, it's a complicated case to be sure, but think about it like this. You know, Marshall is telling us a couple of things. <clears throat> one, one, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. It's a fundamental law, it is law, so it's interpreted by judges. When the Constitution and an ordinary law conflict, like a congressional statute, that's an ordinary law, it is up to judges to reconcile the conflict and tell us which one governs. And an ordinary law repugnant to the Constitution cannot be a law. And so the end result is the Marshall Court declares part of the 1789 Judiciary Act unconstitutional, only the part that expands the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction. Implied in that is the understanding of the Constitution that the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction is spelled out in Article Three, and Congress cannot change it. It cannot expand that. Two, Marshall gives us clues about how the Constitution ought to be interpreted. Remember, affirmative words <laughs> negate other things. So if a word or words give power to, a, to the federal government to do something, those words often, not always, more than seldom, but often, often negate other things. That is a way of interpreting the Constitution, what he calls the particular phraseology. Now, I'll end with this. You know, th this case is, believe it or not, fun to talk about in class. And I always present students with a dilemma. Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall, is a Federalist. Jefferson and Madison are anti-Federalist, Jeffersonian Republicans. Poor William Marbury gets caught in the middle. John Marshall wants to build a strong national government. He subscribes to that Federalist agenda. And he, want, he will use the U.S. Supreme Court to do that. He's got another motivation, too. Third Chief Justice of the United States, he wants to build a strong Supreme Court. No question about that. And at the end of the John Marshall era, in the 1820s, the Supreme Court has emerged as a very powerful institution. 
But along the way, Marshall wants to set the stage. He wants to establish how the Constitution should be interpreted. And he will do that in a way that uh, creates more authority for the federal government, as we will see in a couple of other cases. Think about the personal politics here, though. Marshall absolutely hates Thomas Jefferson. Well, so the story goes. What happens if John Marshall rules in favor of William Marbury and then the Supreme Court grants the writ of mandamus against James Madison to order the delivery of Marbury's commission. What happens next? I would bet that Jefferson and Madison might say no. And then we have a constitutional crisis on our hands where the Supreme Court has ordered the president to do something and the president says no. What if Marshall thinks that through though? What if Marshall says, you know, Marbury's right, he is lawfully a judge because the constitutional process was followed, but the Supreme Court doesn't have the authority to grant the writ of mandamus because Congress screwed up. That's what we end up with. And, you know, John Marshall is probably a brilliant statesman. A good Federalist that he is, he rules in, in favor, in a sense, of William Marbury, the Federalist judge, and he says, Marbury has a right to that commission. So, in one respect, Marbury wins, right? But then Marshall pulls a punch, you know, he, he probably does anticipate that Jefferson would obstruct. And so, Marshall shifts his attention to Congress and says, well, the law giving us jurisdiction to order Madison to turn over that piece of paper, ah, it's unconstitutional anyway. So there's really nothing we can do here. So, you know, as a political scientist, sometimes I think about game theory, where people sort of act according to uh, how they predict other people are going to act. And we can sort of see John Marshall doing that, perhaps. His ultimate goal, though, is to propel the Supreme Court into being a more powerful institution and to protect the Federalist agenda. And I think he does just that, even though in this case, it looks like Jefferson and Madison and the Jeffersonian Republicans win. Now, the story goes that Thomas Jefferson didn't really pay attention to the case Marbury versus Madison. In several letters he wrote, uh, from 1804 all the way into the 18 teens, he mentioned the case and he said, you know, this is a, an unknown power that the Marshall Court has declared for the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary. It remains to be seen how this power is going to work itself out. But it doesn't seem like Jefferson or Madison were all that concerned about the issue of judicial review. All right, well, there you have Marbury versus Madison. It's a complex case, obviously. It's very hard to read as well. But I hope, it, I hope you learned something, maybe. Um, anyway, I'll talk to you later. Thanks.